Well, in the wake of the publication of um, his encyclical letter, Laudato Si, and of many of his recent uh, speeches in Latin America, uh, many supporters of capitalism in the West might be forgiven for thinking that His Holiness has something against the capitalist uh, political economy. In fact, the Pope has spoken out uh, very clearly against an economy predicated upon materialism and greed. He has spoken very bluntly about an economy that kills. In a speech in Bolivia, um, he sounded almost like a rabble-rousing revolutionary, calling upon the poor to rise up and to seize control of their lives, etc. Well, what do we make of all this um, very strong speech coming from Pope Francis? Well, I think, first of all, we have to see him as a prophetic figure. The prophets speak in this strong, often exaggerated way. I think we hear that. But also we have to put the Pope's uh, prophetic remarks within the context of the great tradition of Catholic social teaching. He's not egregious to that tradition. He's not standing opposed to it. But these remarks should be seen in the context of that teaching. Now, what's one of the great constants of that tradition from Leo XIII, late 19th century, all the way through Benedict XVI? One of the constants is a suspicion of socialism. Now, I know it's a slippery term, covers a lot of ground. But the popes define it this way. An economy predicated upon the denial of private property, an economy that uh, militates against the free market, an economy that uh, sows tension between uh, labor and capital, to use the old language, between the owners and workers, etc. So that kind of economy the popes have consistently spoken out against. Which is why it's interesting to me, people like uh, Robert Sirico and uh, Michael Novak and Arthur Brooks and others are correct in saying Catholic social teaching is not a tertium quid that hovers above uh, socialism and capitalism, as though it simply says a plague on both your houses and we represent something new. No, I think it's much truer and fairer to say it's a clear teaching against a socialist uh, economic solutions and it's an embrace, it's a defense of what the popes tend to call the market economy. In fact, John Paul II clearly saw that the market economy is the economic concomitant of a democratic polity. If we feel that democracy is the best political arrangement, and I think most thoughtful people do, well, the economic concomitant of that is one that's based upon the rights, freedom, and dignity of the individual, the right to um, uh, self-assertion, et cetera, et cetera. So the popes, I think, have clearly advocated the market economy and have been against um, socialist arrangements. All right. Having said that, and that's saying a lot. It's important, I think, to keep that in mind. But having said that, doesn't mean the popes are in favor of a completely unfettered capitalism. Capitalism simply run amok. Capitalism doing whatever it wants to do. The answer to that is also a very clear no. The popes have urged what I'd call a double circumscription of the market. If and only if the free market is circumscribed first politically and then morally, so as to make it more just, more humane, and more accessible, if and only if, then it can be seen as morally legitimate. So let me talk first about the the first circumscription, the political. From Leo XIII on, the popes have recognized that. The market can become um, exclusive. The market can um, leave people to the side. People can fall through the cracks of the free market system. The market can, left to its own devices, become rather quickly uh, unfair. And so what have they urged? They've urged all kinds of political uh, reforms, legal restrictions, if you want, upon the market. Think, for example, I'll go back here to the 19th century. Think of child labor laws. Think of uh, workday restrictions. Think of minimum wage requirements. Think of antitrust uh, uh, legislation. Think of the right of workers to unionize, et cetera, et cetera. All of these are legal constraints, if you want, on a, a free market system. Can people of goodwill disagree about the nitty gritty details of all these things? Well, yeah, of course they can, which is why we have a, a, a vibrant political economic debate. Can, for example, people of of intelligence and goodwill disagree about how high the minimum wage should be? Can they disagree about how strictly antitrust legislation should be 
uh, enforced? Can they disagree about uh, all these different uh, legal arrangements? Sure. And I would argue that priests and bishops and popes oughtn't to get into the nitty-gritty details, but rather leave that to those who are specially skilled in the field. But can the church and should the church urge legal um, restriction of the market? Yes, indeed. But here's the second circumscription of the market, which is even more important. I call it a moral circumscription. If and only if the market finds itself situated in the context of a vibrant moral culture which shapes the attitudes of those involved in the market, only then can the market be seen as legitimate. Now, for example, only in a culture that fosters the virtues of fairness, of justice, of concern for the individual, of concern for the earth, of, of religion, so a deep awareness of God, only in that context will the market economy be legitimate. Like, for example, suppose there's no sense of justice. Well, then what good are contracts? Contracts are a basic uh, a mechanism upon which the capitalist economy depends. What good is private property if no one believes that stealing is a bad thing? What good is all your wealth unless you have a keen sense of an obligation to the poor? Otherwise, your wealth will turn on you and destroy you. What good is your... Uh, capitalist achievement if in the process you destroy the earth? What good is it if you have no sense of God and God is an ultimate moral um, limitation on what you're doing? In all those ways, the moral circumscription allows for the legitimacy of the capitalist system. Now, I'm going to argue this. The Pope's remarks in Laudato Si and in Latin America are best understood within this framework. I don't think the Pope is excoriating the market as such. What he's urging is a very strong legal and moral circumscription of the market. I'll give you a couple examples. Now, these are taken from uh, his recent speeches in Latin America. Do we realize that the system, the current economic system, has imposed the mentality of profit at any price with no concern for social exclusion or the destruction of nature? Good, great. He's not speaking about the market as such. He's not saying the market as such, or even profit as such, is a bad thing. Because Catholic social teaching says that profit is a good thing in itself. What he's saying is the mentality of profit at any price, with no concern for social exclusion, those who've fallen through the cracks of the system, or the destruction of nature, those who have no moral sense of how we're part of a, a, a grand natural context. Here's another one. In the current system, he says, an unfettered pursuit of money rules. The service of the common good is left behind. Once capital becomes an idol and guides people's decisions, once greed for money presides over the entire socioeconomic system, it ruins society and it condemns and enslaves men and women. Now, strong words, indeed, prophetic words. But mind you, he's not talking about money as such. He's saying the unfettered pursuit of money that's the problem. That's a moral issue. Where the service of the common goods left behind, where I don't care about the common goods, simply what's good for me. Once capital becomes an idol, okay, is he speaking against capital as such? No, I would say. He's saying when capital becomes an idol. In other words, when that becomes a god for you, that's the problem. When greed for money presides over the entire system, is he saying money's a bad thing? Making money is a bad thing? No. When greed for money presides over the system, that's when um, men and women are condemned and enslaved. Here's something else, too. I'll close with this. The Pope's language is strong, but I would suggest it's no stronger than language we find in other parts of the Church's social teaching. Here's one I know I've quoted before, but really interesting, from Pope Leo XIII, from Rerum Novarum. Listen to the Pope. Now, end of the 19th century. Once the demands of necessity and propriety have been met, the rest that one owns belongs to the poor. Uh, that extraordinary thing. Once the demands of necessity and propriety have been met, so I, I, my basic needs are taken care of, and I even have a you know, comfortable life. It's propriety. After that, everything I own belongs to the poor, says Pope Leo XIII. Well, that's, that's beyond anything Pope Francis has been saying. And the one from St. Ambrose I love, if a man has two shirts in his closet, one belongs to him. The other belongs to the man who has no shirt. 
that's beyond anything that France has been saying in Latin America. My point is, these are landmarks within the Catholic social tradition. It's not against the market as such. The church stands with the free market. But it's the insistence that that market be uh, circumscribed, both politically and morally. Um, the Pope's words, it seems to me, should bother us. Let them be prophetic but always read them within this grander context of the church's social teaching. Mm -hmm.